Welcome to Agathos Ministries for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And today, I am very excited to bring what is arguably one of the most powerful lessons I ever learned in my entire life about learning things. So learning about learning, learning about agreement and disagreement, about liking and disliking, and we'll talk about the lemming principle. Now, part of the reason this is so critically important, and you know, a lot of times when we talk about best lessons and most important lessons, think of it, there's this category called most important. And in this category called most important, and this category called best, there can be any number of things. This is absolutely transformational, because I will tell you, whether you are a child, or an adult, or a parent, or grandparent, or great-grandparent, no matter your age, it is amazing to me, and hopefully it will be amazing to you, how many people, honestly, do not get this. So I want you to get this today. Agree and disagree, like and dislike and lemmings. Isaiah 118a reads, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Now, does it say, come now and let us feel together? Come now and let us like and dislike together. Or does it talk about reason? Reason, logic. Let's reason this out. Let's talk about this. Let's sort it out. Let's think about it. Figure out the logic. See how it works. This is a principle level, a logic level discussion. Come now, let us reason together, says who? The Lord. So God is not a God of blind faith. God is not a God of lemmings. God is a God of reasoned people. Logical, principled people. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to, what? Give an answer. Now, should your answer be, well, that's what I feel in my heart. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Be prepared to give an answer for the reason, for the hope. Now, hope here, the, the Greek term that's translated hope, isn't like we talk about in English. A lot of times we talk about, well, you know, I can hope it'll happen. Usually when we use the word hope, what we mean is, well, I don't really expect it, but I kind of hope that it'll work out that way. The word here for hope actually means a certain expectancy. That when the Bible uses the word hope, it means that you have faith, that this is the truth. It is a logical extension of what you know to be true, and because of that logic, you fully expect that this thing will occur. So talking about salvation, I mean, do you absolutely know for sure that you are in heaven before you die? No. There's a whole bunch of people all over the world that believe they will be in whatever their version of heaven is. Most of them are wrong. Because most of them are wrong, you always have to be open to the possibility that we also are wrong. Which is why you search it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do not treat it casually. Now, and then quoting scripture I don't even have in my notes here. But it says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Meaning, do not take it for granted. Don't just go, oh, well, you know, Pastor Scott said I was saved. So obviously I must be saved. Because according to the Gospel of Agathos, oh, wait, that's not in the Bible, is it? So you read the word of God for yourself. 2 Timothy 4.3 For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound meaning logical, and doctrine meaning spiritual truth. They will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, basically wanting to hear what they want to hear, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Now, what's uh, interesting about this, of course, is uh, do you want to know how you know for sure that someone's doctrine is not sound and how you know that people are accumulating teachers to their own desires to tickle their ears? Because they're not like us. 
Now, no one would actually say that, but when you actually talk to people who will cite this concept and, and verse, that's actually kind of what they're saying. If you listen to them, you realize, so you, you don't really have logical principles you use to arrive at that conclusion. What you have is judgments and condemnation. And so in this, we're going to explore some of this, of sound doctrine, ears tickled, and accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Because everybody agrees that people do this. Other people, not us. I mean, talk to them. And in fact, if you want to know the definition of unteachable, unteachable means, well, I told you what I say the truth is, and you disagree with me, so you're unteachable. I mean, you, Lord knows I've heard that a lot. When a lot of the worst disasters that have occurred in my life is because I was over-teachable. I over-trusted human teachers, and I followed what they taught without thorough critical thinking at the principal level. And had I done that more, had I been a little less teachable, a little less open-minded, and a little bit more thoughtful in my approach, I could have probably have avoided mm, about half of the disasters that have occurred in my life. Mark 7, 9. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Now this was Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Now we don't do this today, do we? We have no traditions that are not perfectly in accordance with God. Well, if you go to the Catholic and the Greek Orthodox Church, to them tradition is co-equal to Scripture. And they have actually logical reasons for that. But then you look at all the Protestant churches too. Is there only one Protestant church? Do many Protestant churches have their own traditions? Between the Catholics, the Orthodox, and the various and sundry Protestants, are there a great many traditions? Are many of those traditions mutually exclusive? Because... All of them cannot possibly be true. You therefore know all of them cannot possibly be God. Right? Logically. And you know, one of the things you'll hear around the Gothos is that we fully believe that a church has a right to be legalistic. And we fully believe that a church has a right to make rules that are not in Scripture. We believe in that. So long as they teach that this is not the command of God. This is the tradition of this denomination. So if you say, you know, Baptists do not dance. If you are going to be a serious Baptist, you will not dance. And they note, this is not God's command. This is a Baptist tradition. Now, if you are a Christian and you dance before the Lord, that's not a problem. But if you are a Baptist, especially a leader in the Baptist church, and you dance, that is a problem. You know, if you're a fundamentalist, Fundamentalists do not drink, period. Fundamentalists do not gamble, period. And I just lost the guy's name, I think it's Lee Roberson, took over a, a small fundamentalist church, and one of the first things he did is he went to uh, one of the families, I think, had their children in ballet, and he told them, you have to take your children out of ballet or you can't be a leader in this church. And their argument was, well, the Bible doesn't say you can't dance. He says, I know the Bible doesn't say you can't dance, but we are a fundamentalist church. Fundamentalists don't dance. Now, he was up front. He said, that's not a biblical command. It is a denominational command. If you want to be a leader in this denominational church, you will abide by the denominational traditions. If, however, you want to abide by more liberal biblical interpretations, go to the evangelical church down the road. That's fine. But you can't do that here. Now, is that legitimate? Now, if he says, well, the Lord says, okay, now you're misinterpreting scripture. And so, setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition, now that's the problem. We say, well, I know God says A, but we're going to say not A. <laughs> now you've got a problem, right? So that's Mark 7, 9. So agree and disagree versus like and dislike. Now, many people confuse these concepts. Like is confused with agree. You hear something and go, wow, I like that. That's what you feel. But what you say is, well, I totally agree with that. Do you? Did you understand it and all of its implications enough to agree 
or did you just like it? Dislike is often confused with disagree. Now, I hear that a lot. And any Agathos teacher is likely to hear, well, I don't agree with everything you say. So, well, tell me something you disagree with. Well, I disagree with, you know, say one that's going around right now is I disagree with the leaving principle. Like, okay, so how do you think it should work? Well, I just disagree with you. It's like, well, then what's your alternative? Well, I don't think people should ever get divorced. It's like, okay, so you want to go with me down to the women's shelter, find the battered wife, find the battered children, and send them home to the man who beat them and hospitalized one of the kids? Is that what you're saying God says? Well, no, obviously not. Like, okay, so how do you justify that? Well, you know, I think God understands. Well, really, you know, there's only two ways to uh, hang on to that view. One is to use the leaving principle, where you say, well, God declares that deal breakers are okay, and I believe that physical abuse ought to be a deal breaker. Well, that's using the leaving principle, which is funny because what did they just do? They said, I disagree with the leaving principle, but then they have to use it to arrive there unless they do something much, much scarier than that. And thus they say, well, I know that the Bible says that you should never get divorced, period. Or the Bible says you should never get divorced except for adultery. But, I mean, you know, abuse too. And maybe addiction. It's like, oh, okay, so you're going to stand before God and tell him, I believe your rule says. And I am going to supersede your rule on my own authority and add to your word to declare God wrong and me right. Does anyone think that they think that they're doing that? But that's because they follow like and dislike. Not agree and disagree. They don't really disagree. They think they disagree, but what they really are doing is they dislike. If they really are disagreeing, either they are going to send the abused wife and the abused children back to the man who abused them, or... They are declaring themselves to be God. Or they're using the very principle they say they don't believe in. Is that interesting thinking? Do you think they think that's what they're doing? It's because they didn't think it through. So when people say, I do not agree with what you said, they often mean, I do not like what you said. And if they disagree, they will really understand what you said. They will consider it, and they will have some idea of what is wrong with it in whole or in part. And if they disagree usefully, and we're going to get into this in a moment too, they will have an alternative to which they are willing to subject to the same type and the same level of scrutiny that they subjected the side they disagree with. Now, that's a useful disagreement. So, like and dislike. Like and dislike are emotional or self-serving reactions. Like, people like things because it gives them permission. People like things because it absolves them from responsibility, and as often as not, people like things because it matches what they want the truth to be. Now, here's one of the things that happens sometimes, say, you know, since we're talking about the leaving principle. Some people actually like the no-divorce rule because the no-divorce rule gives them permission to be whoever they want to be doing whatever they want to do, behaving however they want to behave, and it's okay, my partner is not allowed to leave me. And so they give themselves permission. It absolves them from responsibility. Because now, if I stay, say if we go back to the uh, women's shelter, and the wife goes back to her husband, it's not her fault she's putting her children in harm's way. It's not her fault she's putting herself in harm's way. It's God's fault. It's God's responsibility, right? Because she's saying, God says, I have to do this. So I'm not a bad mother because I expose my children to danger. I'm a good mother because I'm obeying God. I have no responsibility here. This is God's responsibility. Or it matches what you want the truth to be. Now, that actually may not always be self-serving because sometimes what you want the truth to be is you want the truth to be what you always thought the truth was. You want the truth to be what you were first taught the truth was. 
Now, the way this one basically works at a very, very simple, simple level is you don't want to have been wrong all this time. Very often, the older somebody is, the more difficult it is to convince them they've been wrong. Now, say, for instance, I learned a certain way of doing things when I was a kid. Now, I'm 43 now, so suppose I was learning this growing up, and that I can actually recall following the rule at a three-year-old level when I was three years old, and here I am 40 years later still following the same rule, and now I have to face the possibility that my entire life has been based on a lie. Now, suppose if I was also a parent, and to also have to figure that an the principles I use to raise my children have been based on a lie. Especially if some of my children are adults. I mean, if I'm 43, say, I, you know, my mother was 20 when I was born, so say I had a 23-year-old child. And my brother and I are two and a half years apart, so say I had a 23-year-old child, a 20-year-old child, and we'll say an 18-year-old child. So they're all adults. And suppose my 23-year-old is a daughter married and has children of her own now. And I have to face, I have been wrong my entire life. My mother, who I love, was wrong her entire life. I raised my children wrong. My children now know this wrong thing that I taught them and they are raising my grandchildren wrong and it's my fault. So like can be, it matches what you want the truth to be and what you want the truth to be is you want the truth to be how you've always done it. Because facing being that wrong for that long is really hard. So you will frequently hear me tell people it's better to learn something before you're 14 than after you're 40. The older you are when you start to get a lesson, the harder it is to get the lesson. Because you have to admit you were wrong. Now what about the people who never admit they're wrong? They never apologize for doing anything wrong. They will apologize for you being hurt. Like the thing that was wrong about what they did was you got hurt. And you just need to not be hurt. Because I was right. And you got hurt stupidly. Because you're stupid. Anyone ever gotten those kind of apologies? Well, I'm sorry that you're hurt. Or I'm sorry if I hurt you. So, oh, you know, the uh, blubbering tears doesn't give you a clue that maybe you did hurt me. So, they, well, if you're hurt, I'm sorry that you're so sensitive and weak and idiotic that you got hurt by my perfection. <laughs> but, you know, slime balls like you do sometimes get hurt by perfection. So, I mean, because apology is I apologize for what I did wrong. And a lot of people have a lot of trouble admitting that they're wrong. How hard do you think it would be for someone like that to admit that the way they've always grown up, the way their family of origin raised them was that wrong? The way they raised their children was that wrong? That's tough for people, right? So it's very easy for people to like teaching that matches up with what they've always done. They like teaching that gives them permission. They like teaching that absolves them from responsibility. And they like teaching that matches what they want the truth to be. Now, dislike. Dislike. People will often dislike things because it does not give them permission. So say on the leaving principle still, or on our responsibility principle, people dislike teaching that does not give them permission, especially permission to do what they've always done. So say you have a couple that uses the no-divorce rule, and the consequence of the no-divorce rule is, well, I don't really need to solve my problem I don't really need to work to solve our problem because you can't leave anyway, so what's the hurry? You're not going anywhere, I'm not going anywhere, so that means it's okay for us to leave these problems here. The leaving principle says, you know, these problems are a deal breaker, they're a deal breaker. The clock is ticking, we better fix it. That we do not have permission to leave these here, especially if we're parents. That we do not have permission to pass these problems on to our children. That the no divorce rule says, I have a right to keep my baggage, and you have an obligation to live with it. The leaving principle says, I have no right to keep my baggage, because you are under no obligation to live with it. 
And so people will dislike a teaching because it does not give them permission to do what they're doing or do what they want to do. People will dislike teaching that requires them to take responsibility for those things that they do not want to take responsibility for. They want it to be God's responsibility. Pray and wait for your miracle. Why? Because I don't need to change. It's God's responsibility. I don't need to go job hunting. I just need to pray to God to give me a job. Because the Lord is my provider. And if I go out putting in applications every day, I'm just doing that in my own strength. And you get people that will do things like that. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to us. But there are a lot of people that want to put all of the responsibility on God. And basically, they're doing the adult version of, Daddy, do my homework for me. Daddy, take my test for me. I shouldn't have to do my own homework. I shouldn't have to take my own test. I want you to do it for me. I want to not do the homework and not take the test, and I expect you to still get me an A. Because they deny cause and effect. People dislike teaching that forces change and growth. So if in order to comply with a teaching, it's going to require that you change. I mean, it might not even be you know, growth. It just might be a sideways change. Instead of walking down this path, you have to walk down that path. And that if the teaching is true, you have to start doing things differently. Or, even worse for some people, if this teaching is true, you have to grow. That's not okay for you to stay the way you are. Now keep in mind, it is okay to be any way that you are. According to Agatha's teaching, it is not okay to stay there. So suppose you are awesome and amazing. And a year from now, you have not learned a single thing. Five years from now, you have not grown one little bit. Is that okay? No! No! Now, part of that is that black belt mentality. It's always moving forward. So you got your first degree black belt. That's fantastic. In a couple of years, you should be a second degree black belt, or at least still moving forward. Eventually, you should be third and fourth and fifth until you admit that you quit. I mean, if you're uh, in third grade, that's great. Next year, you should be in fourth grade. So it's fantastic to be wherever you are. It's not fantastic to stay there, right? Always be moving forward. So it forces change and growth. People dislike stuff that forces change and growth. Or that it does not match what you want the truth to be. Like, well, that's not the way I've always done it. That's not the way I grew up. That's not the way I raised my kids. That's not, I don't like that truth. Because I have to admit that I'm wrong if that's right. Sometimes one of the very, very most difficult things to do is to catch someone who has been doing something for a generation and convince them that they're wrong. Even if they have had a swath of destruction behind them, they will still cling to, I have to be right because if I'm not right, that means that was my fault and that I have been wrong for 40 years. How hard would it be to admit that you were wrong for a generation? For a grandparent or a great-grandparent to admit that they've been wrong for two and three generations. So that's the dislike. So the like and dislike. This is, that's part of what tells you, boy, do you want to get this stuff when you're young. The older you are, when you start facing some of these truths, the harder it will be to accept them. Now, intellectual and principal reasons, agree and disagree. Now, agree and like are not the same thing. In order to agree with something, you have to understand it and consider it, and you agree, meaning you think it is right. It's correct. This is truth. That's agreement. So if someone says, oh, you know, I agree with you. The next question, if I care to engage in the full discussion, is, well, explain it to me. Well, just, it was just really, really good. It's like, well, then explain it to me. If you agree with it, explain it to me. Now, if they agree with it, should they be able to explain it? Ideally, yes. Now, may they necessarily have the words for it? Maybe not. I mean, you know, they might have this vague vocabulary that kind of talks around it, because sometimes abstractions are difficult to uh, discuss, but they will have enough to indicate to you that they understand it and they thought about it. 
and that they think it is right. Now, you know, one of the ways you can really tell if someone thinks something really is right, if they're willing to take action on it. Otherwise, it's just an intellectual assent. You know, it's like in mathematics, like, you know, I heard you're teaching on 2 plus 2 is 4, you know, I, yeah, I learned in English class reading George Orwell that 2 plus 2 is 5, and I, I looked at your logic, and I thought, like, wow, 2 plus 2 really is 4, that's amazing. And then tomorrow you take a math test, and you put 2 plus 2 equals 5. Did you intellectually assent to the lesson, or did you really agree with it? It's just an assent. If you really agreed with it, from now on, when you face the question, what is 2 plus 2, you will answer 4 and stop answering 5. Disagree is, it is understood, it is considered, and you disagree. So if someone says truly, you disagree, or I disagree with you, say, okay, well, explain to me what you think my position is. If they cannot do that, then that means they probably don't disagree. They probably dislike. One of the fundamental rules of disagreement begins with understanding. Do you understand what it is you're disagreeing with? Now, one of the things that uh, you'll run into a lot, and I certainly run into a lot, is called a straw man argument. And that is that you change the other person's position to something ludicrous so that you can disagree with it. So once again, using the leaving principle. That one of the things the leaving principle addresses is something called the any cause divorce. And that's specifically what Jesus was addressing in the New Testament is the Jews at that time had something called the any cause divorce. And the any cause divorce basically said you can get divorced for any cause you can name. Now back in those days, only men had the right to divorce. So women couldn't divorce for any reason, period, ever. And so when it says, you know, that adultery is the only cause of poor divorce, and that's some, one of the things you'll hear people talk about, legally, only the woman's adultery was cause for divorce, not the man's adultery, because only the man could divorce. So unless he would divorce her because of his own adultery, probably wasn't going to happen. If he was going to divorce her over his own adultery, he would have divorced her first, right? But the any cause divorce could literally be you name any cause. There's no need to discuss deal breakers because anything can be a deal breaker. Oh, you burnt the toast today. Well, bye. <laughs> and it's worse than that. It's like, well, look at that. Some of your hair's getting gray. Well, I didn't sign on for that. Are those wrinkles on your face? And that could be a cause. Literally. That was a cited cause for divorce. There are wrinkles on your face that were not there when I married you. Now, according to the leaving principle, you need to determine what your deal breakers are. Now, imagine if you're getting married to some man, and he says, well, just so you know up front, one of my deal breakers is you are not allowed to get older. How many women would sign on for that deal? And say, well, let me see. Um, you know, I don't think I can do that. Now, the leaving principle says you need to establish your deal breakers, and what the deal breakers are could be deal breakers, and so on and so forth. But it does not tell you what your deal breakers are required to be. Which means, in a sense, the deal breakers can be anything, but they need to be legitimate deal breakers that you are willing to declare this is a valid reason to divorce. Now, you could strawman that and say, ah, oh, you see, he's saying any cause of divorce, anything could be a cause. Like, well, no, you can decide your own deal breakers, and you might decide your deal breakers are anything. And what your deal breaker is might be a deal breaker for the other person. So if I say, well, my deal breaker is you're not allowed to get old. Well, then on your side, you should say, well, then, you know, a deal breaker I cannot possibly comply with is a deal breaker for me. Let's not get married. And so you get to decide. You know, we have uh, one of our young couples. Um, he is of Cambodian descent. And, you know, she's born and bred American. Now, what if he said that, you know, one of my options if we have financial trouble in the United States is to take our U.S. dollars and go to Cambodia. I don't know what the exchange rate is or cost of living there. But suppose, um, you know, a moderate income here is upper middle class there. And that he says, you know, if we have financial trouble here, my first solution is to move to Cambodia. Now, can she say, oh, moving to Cambodia is a deal breaker for me. 
I am not moving to a country where I do not speak the language and I do not speak Cambodian, nor do I intend to learn to speak Cambodian. Now, he might say, well, a wife who is unwilling to move to Cambodia with me would be a deal breaker for me. Should they get married? No. Now, what if she says, like, well, you know, once we're married, you're the husband, you're in charge. If you say Cambodia, I guess we're going to Cambodia. But that's not a deal breaker for me. I will follow you there. I just want to find some place in Cambodia where they speak some English, so if you will agree that we will only move to places in Cambodia where I can find somebody to speak to, I will agree to go to Cambodia with you. Would that also be legitimate? Yeah. And they could do it either way. And she might decide, well, you know, I wouldn't have agreed to this 30 years ago, but, you know, this day and age of uh, internet, email... You know, I, we could get internet phone service and I could talk internationally for the cost of an internet sign-up. And so long as he agrees to live in a place where we can get high-speed internet so I can talk to my family every day, you know, that'll be fine. 30 years ago, that would have been expensive. You, know, you agree that we'll get some video computers so that way I can still see my family and we can talk to them live. I'm okay with that. And that would be legitimate. And so the deal breakers can be anything... But you can't just make them up as you go. Now, the straw man is, oh, that's just the any cause divorce. You can just decide, oh, whatever it could be a thing. And so that's straw man. So that's not uh, proper disagreement because you're straw manning the argument or doing a non sequitur. That means the logic does not follow. And you say, well, the Lord says he hates divorce. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll give you that, although it's a misunderstanding of the Hebrew word if that's all you're taking that as. Like, so therefore, you know, you have to, once you get married, you're married to the right person. I mean, I've heard that teaching. That God says this is the right person for you. It's like, oh, well, thank goodness. I thought after my husband murdered our second child that maybe I should divorce him. But to disagree, you will think that something is incorrect in whole or in part. A useful disagreement, meaning it is understood. It is considered. You disagree. You believe it is incorrect in whole or in part. And you figure out what you think is incorrect. And, and try to work out what you believe is correct. Sometimes, and this is a John Maxwell pet peeve, sometimes all people manage to do is be contrary. In fact, um, brilliant politicians will put forth ideals with nothing concrete. Because can you attack an ideal? No, you can only attack concrete. Now, I will tell you one of the most genius politicians in doing this um, in recent memory was Bill Clinton. Now, I don't care what you think of Bill Clinton as a president or as a person or you know, what your party affiliation is, but he was a brilliant politician because what he would say is, we need to solve this problem, and I expect Congress to come up with a solution and get it on my desk. And no matter what the opposing party's solution was, he could always attack it on the specifics and look like, quote-unquote, he's doing something. Like, I'm trying to solve this problem, and all they're sending me is this garbage. Like, I can't sign this. You guys figure it out and get me something I can actually sign. Now, note, he didn't put forth a solution. He just kept arguing on the problem. Now, some people do this. They're just contrary. All they will do is attack, 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 attack. It's like, okay, well, what do you think the answer is? What do you have that works better for you? How's that working out for you? Are there any unintended consequences to that? Because here's the thing, is you, then you seek. So first, you, if you disagree, figure out what you think is wrong, figure out what you think is right, and then truly seek to understand your own perspective. Consider its implications and the ramifications and the potential unintended consequences or known consequences and subject your own perspective to the same type, which means if you feel the right to non sequitur or to straw man the other side, well, then you're saying that it's okay to do that to your side. But same type and same level of scrutiny to which you subjected the opposing point of view. 
Basically, you attack your own position as hard as you attack the other side's position. You expose it to the same level of scrutiny. So here's one of the things, um, you know, as a preacher, my stuff's out there. You know, there's handouts, people can get stuff in writing. You know, I've you know, written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of stuff, so it's down there. Uh, you can go online and you can download it. I mean, I can't say this isn't really my perspective. This isn't really what I teach. It's out there. It's recorded. This is being recorded. This will be posted on the internet. CDs will be burned. I can't go back and say, well, I never really said that. But it's interesting to me how many people will argue with you, but they will not put their stuff in front of people. They will not write it down and post it. I mean, I have respect for people I disagree with, that I flat out disagree with who will at least go on record, this is what I believe, period. Because once it's out there, it's out there. And someone has to have a certain amount of commitment to do that. Now, it's interesting how often people will have enough commitment to argue with you, to oppose you, to undermine you, so long as they don't have to put their own thing in writing and post it. Like, it might be interesting to have a section of the Agathos website of uh, the best of, of Agathos attacks, attacks against Agathos, of the people who most strongly disagreed with our position and what they had to say. The problem is we'd have to get people to actually commit to writing what it is they think the truth is and commit it to writing and be willing to let us post it. And it's amazing how many people actually would not be willing to do that. Now, lemmings, talking about the lemming principle. The lemming principle is to follow blindly to devastation. So if someone is following blindly to devastation, that's the lemming principle. Now, here's the legend, and it's a legend of the lemmings. Uh, in your handout is a little bit about it, but just so everyone knows, uh, lemmings don't go commit mass suicides over cliffs. That is a popular uh, misconception about them. However, they will sometimes commit mass suicide over cliffs, but this is what's actually going on is the lemmings are a small uh, rodent. And over the course of about a 10-year cycle, their population tends to grow. And the population tends to grow rather explosively. And about every 10 years or so, they completely overeat their area and have to fan out in search of food. Now, lemmings swim. So when they spread out in all directions looking for their food, if they hit ponds or lakes or whatever, they'll jump in the water and they'll swim across to the other side. Well, lemmings don't understand the concept of ocean. And so they will sometimes come to the ocean, jump in the water, and go swimming to the other side. There's a problem with that. The other side of the ocean is way farther than the lemmings can swim. Now, lemmings will also jump. Sometimes they will jump off of cliffs. You know, they come to the edge of the land and there's water down below and they see that there's water down below. They'll jump off the cliff into the water to go swim to the other side looking for food. Now, it would be mass suicide if they all just stuck around where there is no food. They'd all starve to death. So that's why they're spreading out. And so their mass suicides off of the cliffs of uh, Norway have nothing to do with an intent to commit suicide. They're not intentionally dwindling their numbers with mass suicide. They're looking for food, and they don't get it because, well, they're rodents. No one gave them a map to tell them that uh, this water you don't want to jump into. There is no other side you can reach. That water over there, you can't jump into that lake because there is another side that you can reach. So go jump in there and swim to the other side. Don't jump over here because you're just going to drown. So that's where the story of the mass suicides uh, came from, and it's been popularized in the media in this last century, and there's some notes in your handout if you want to know a little bit about how that happened. But because of the legend of the lemmings, calling someone a lemming means that they blindly follow to their own detriment. They follow blindly to devastation. Now, some people will define quote-unquote lemming. They'll call you a lemming if you agree with all or nearly all of something. To quote-unquote prove that you're not a lemming, you must show you disagree with something. Now imagine for a moment how moronic we would think someone would have to be to say, well, you know, I think that you're just a public school lemming because you believe all of this arithmetic stuff that public school is teaching you. 
So you tell me where you disagree with the multiplication table so I know you're not a lemming. You go, well, I agree with the whole multiplication table and addition and subtraction and multiplication and division and fractions and decimals and all of that. Ha! You're a lemming. You can't think for yourself. Should I think for myself? Look, 2 plus 2 equals 7. Ha! That proves I'm an independent thinker and you're an idiot. You go like, well, you know, somebody's an idiot. <laughs> How about engineering? It's like, well, you know, most architectural engineers are uh, lemmings. They just do it all these engineering stress tests, all of that. What's all that about? I'm a free thinker. I don't believe in all that mathematical mumbo jumbo. I just design things the way I want. In fact, recently we were at uh, Universal Studios Islands of Adventure in Florida in Dr. Seuss Land. And we're just marveling at the fact that the engineers have to work out the math and all the structural stuff to make sure that we can make this swirl and curve and bend and not fall down in a hurricane. I mean, they're in Orlando. I remember one year, just a few years ago, two hurricanes crisscrossed over central Florida in the space of a month. One cut from the Gulf side heading to the Pacific, and uh, weeks later, one cut from the Pacific side on its way to the Gulf. I was thinking, okay, so Dr. Seussland, with all the swirls and the curves and the bends, had to withstand two hurricanes. But we were just there. It's still there. So the engineers did a good job. And you know, I bet you they weren't the free thinkers who ignored the mathematics of engineering. How would you like to get on a plane if someone said, well, all this aerospace lift plus thrust must exceed load plus drag? I don't believe in all that stuff. I don't like the way those planes look. I'm going to build it my own way. Well, the only thing that will save your life is the fact that thing would never get off the ground in the first place, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, what if it did get off the ground? What if someone said, well, you know, the problem I had with this helicopter is that the load was a little too heavy. Since I want to put more people in, you know, what I did is I got rid of 180 pounds of gasoline. And you go, like, uh, I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, what? Are you a gasoline lemming? I mean, we would never do that. That's stupid, isn't it? And we all know it's stupid, unless we're the ones doing it. And so you don't have to disagree with something to prove you're not a lemming. Now, if you're agreeing with stuff that's getting you hurt, okay, now that's lemming. If you're following stuff just because you like it, even though it's destructive, that's lemming. So the lemming principle specifically applies to things known or believed to be destructive. Clinging to knowingly destructive things is lemming. Now here's something about uh, the no divorce rule and its uh, various permutations. Is we know in the secular world that has no rules. All you have, you, I mean I've had people tell me, well I'm not in love anymore. I still love them, I'm just not in love. You say, okay, well, what does in love mean different than love? Well, I just don't, don't feel that spark anymore. Oh, okay, so it's chemistry. So now that you've settled into the relationship, now that you actually know each other, now that you're not fueled by romantic fantasy, and now that you're facing reality, that's a cause for divorce for you. It's like, okay, well, you know, I, I can't stop you from getting divorced, but any person you get involved with needs to know, when I stop having that spark, I get divorced. Now, would you marry someone who said, when I stop having the feelings, I leave you? That should be a deal breaker for you, right? And so we, no, that, that's the secular perspective. What's their divorce rate? Eh, about 50%. However, in the Christian church, we know better than that. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in our heart. We live by the power of God, at least some of us do. Might not even be most of us, but some percentage of us follow the biblical principles. We do it right. We understand the no divorce rule. And so, our divorce rate happens to be exactly the same. Much of the chagrin of pastors that keep trying to preach and teach by the word of God, by the biblical principle, and try to get people to understand it's no divorce, no divorce, no divorce. Why can't you guys get that through your head? Because pastors who nail this better than anybody have a divorce rate of about 50%. 
So um, how many people would therefore agree that logically, if that whole way of doing things produces no better result than no rule whatsoever, the chances are pretty high that that must not be the way it works. Or at least on some percentage level, even if you assume only 20% of Christians get it right, the Christian divorce rate should be 20% lower, right? And even if you assume only ha half of pastors blow it as badly as everybody else, and only half of pastors actually practice what they preach, their divorce rate should be half. But it isn't. So clinging to that, wouldn't that logically sound like, well, that might be lemming thinking then, huh? Clinging to falsified hypotheses is lemming. Now, without naming any names, I did a field trip to a uh, creation museum once. And we spent too much time in the first, I think, three rooms talking about all of the stuff that they were still promoting that had already been falsified. That was still being clung to because they didn't have a better hypothesis. It turned out, in some of these areas, that the evolutionary scientists had solid information that falsified the creation science theories. But because the creation scientists had not yet come up with another hypothesis, they still clung to the old one, pending a new one. Now, what's interesting, now this is uh, one of the things I had to talk with a biology professor. Now, I was still a college student at the time. Now, I am a creationist. In fact, I'm a young earth creationist, so I am one of the, uh, the radicals in that sense. But I also understand the validity of old earth creationism. I understand the validity of evolution. I understand the validity of all of the positions. And so I don't argue them from, well, your side's idiotic, and that's just on faith. And, and then I, which, of course, doesn't allow them to make the same argument to me. I was talking to a biology professor, and I, you know, I basically just told him, you know, I'm a creationist. And he said, oh, so you're one of those, huh? I said, yeah, and I was just curious, uh, as a scientist, what is your biggest problem with creationism? And he says, the creationist scientists are dishonest. I said, oh, yeah, they are, aren't they? And I hate that. And he looked at me like he was astonished to hear a creationist actually say, I hate it when my side's dishonest. And I told him, because if my side is right, it doesn't need dishonesty to back itself up. And if my side is wrong, I want to know that. And I can't know that if my side's lying because I don't have enough of a background in science to always know when they're lying. Fortunately, I have a lot of evolutionary training, and so I know where our side has been falsified already, and I can address those points. And after I said that, he said, okay, well, you know, well, I have to admit the evolutionist side lies sometimes, too. He conceded the point. I didn't have to argue it. Stuart had actually a brilliant uh, discussion with one of his biology professors about it, and the biology professor cited an old experiment and uh, without getting into all the, the details of the experiment, that they basically had a whole bunch of very intelligent people design the system where they could produce some of the initial amino acids that le are the building blocks of life. Never mind the fact that more than 90% of the stuff they produce is also toxic to those amino acids. And all Stuart asked, like, so you're saying that a bunch of intelligent people can design a system to show that you don't need any intelligent design? Yeah, he, he. <laughs> and this biology professor smiled and looked at him and was like, you know, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> I mean, a brilliant point. Yes, she conceded. She's like, that makes sense. And so long as she's not an ideologue, he can still get a good grade in her class. So that's clinging to falsified hypotheses as Lemmy. Now remember useful disagreement. What is destructive should be considered by cause and effect. If you think a lesson of principle caused the destruction, think it through logically. Investigate it factually and work out your own hypotheses on how you think it ought to have worked. So say, for instance, especially when you're talking about relationship principles, how many people does it take for a relationship to work? Two. So what if one person follows the principles and the other one doesn't? Will the relationship work? No. 
So, like, if I teach, like, well, tell you what, this is how this works. We have this really, really long table. You pick up that side, I'll pick up this side, and then we can carry the table easily. And so you go pick up your side, and I don't pick up my side. And you end up having to drag the table across the hardwood floor, and you score the hardwood floor. And so, ah, you see, that principle doesn't work. How do you know the principle doesn't work? It wasn't done. In fact, if anything, that actually goes to demonstrate that not following the principles causes destruction. You do not yet know whether or not the principles work. You know violation of the principle scored the hardwood floor. That doesn't tell you whether or not the principles work if both sides actually do what they're supposed to do, does it? So you think it through logically, investigate it factually, work out your own hypothesis, and then subject your hypothesis, your perspective, the same type and level of scrutiny to which you subjected the opposing point of view. If you think this way is devastating or destructive, what do you have that's better? So the no divorce rule, as practiced by clergy, the biblical ways of doing things according to the traditions already addressed earlier as Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, that this is the traditional way we've always done it. Okay? Is that destructive? Now some people say, well, you know, your leaving principle is going to cause tons of divorces. Well, let's look at that logically. Absolutely no principle whatsoever has exactly the same divorce rate as the no divorce rule. Therefore, logically, unless you're mandating divorce, are you likely to have a higher divorce rate by trying something different? Not likely. You already have examples. Okay, on one extreme we have 50% divorce rate. On the other extreme we have 50% divorce rate. Well, we can hardly do worse by trying something different, can we? Also in useful disagreement, remember, on falsified. Falsified should be considered by evidence. If you think a lesson of principle is falsified, investigate it factually. And work out your own hypothesis and how you think it ought to have worked. Sounds pretty similar, doesn't it? Then, of course, what's the next thing? Subject your own hypothesis, your own perspective, the same type and level of scrutiny to which you subjected the opposing point of view. Agreement with truth is wisdom. So what if someone does not teach until they've really thoroughly investigated something? And so because they really thoroughly investigated it, that their teaching is 99% true. And the 1% that they have that's not true, that they're open to having it subjected to scrutiny, and they will modify their position accordingly. And it just so happens that you end up agreeing with them almost 100%. Does that make you a lemming? No, so if I teach you, okay, we have the number one. After the number one comes two. If you're a lemming, you'll believe that. If you're not a lemming, you'll pick some other number to put after one. And you go like, well, that's ridiculous. But that's actually what some people want you to do. They want you to demonstrate you're not a lemming by proving you disagree with something that you believe is right. How bizarre is that? But people will do that. Liking truth is lucky. Some people will hear truth and they like it. Well, they got lucky because they're liking or not liking. They're using their emotion to make the decision on truth. And so long as, you know, what you like happens to be truth, you got lucky. Agreeing with truth is wisdom. Not liking and rejecting truth and not paying a price is also luck, but that's luck you should expect will run out. That's a drunk driver syndrome. 50% of all driving fatalities are caused by a drunk driver. Now, if you get drunk and you try to drive home drunk, you will usually make it home without a problem. Usually. So it says, oh, well, you see, I got drunk one time, and I drove home, and I didn't die, and I didn't kill anybody either. I didn't even get a ticket. That proves it's okay to drive drunk. Does it? No. You got lucky. We don't say that any given time driving drunk guarantees someone dies. What we say is half of all deaths occur because someone was drunk. If we can keep people from being drunk, you will have better judgment on the road and you won't make stupid mistakes. Well, 
you might still make stupid mistakes. But you won't make as many stupid mistakes. You won't make stupid mistakes thinking that they were brilliant. Like some people say, well, I drive better when I'm drunk. So, no, you're just too inebriated to know how stupidly you're driving. You just think you're driving better because your ability to assess yourself is impaired. And so that's luck. You disagree with truth. You don't like truth. You reject truth. And every time you get away with not paying a price is luck. Sooner or later, the odds will catch up with you. Just like, by the way, if you practice truth, sooner or later you win. You know, in economics, the vast majority of multimillionaires have uh, three to four bankruptcies in their history. They just kept getting up and doing it differently, making distinctions, gaining wisdom and insight, trying again. I mean, that's why, you know, if you want to be a multimillionaire, um, go all out on some low-stakes stuff first. So say we have a, a steward again. I'll talk about him because I think he's brilliant. But um, don't tell him I said so. I don't want it to go to his head. Uh, right now, one of the visions he has is to open up a really, really cool restaurant I won't record because um, just in case anyone hears it and has the money to start now, I don't want his idea stolen. But... <laughs> But in order to do that, the average restaurant has a return of 3% return on investment. And so you have to be an exceptional restaurant to really make it. Well, if the average multimillionaire has three to four bankruptcies, do you think I want him going bankrupt on his very first attempt on this one big, brilliant vision of his? No! So what do you suppose my recommendation is? Go all out... On small-scale stuff where total failure is not going to cost you a bankruptcy. So you can get your quote-unquote bankruptcies without having to go bankrupt. And then make your distinctions, learn, try either the same thing again or try it differently. Make all your distinctions without losing everything. And so you can get your three or four big-time total failures, learn from them, launch forward from them, without having to lose everything in the process. And then he'll be ready to tackle his restaurant vision because he will have made some of his distinctions in business and sales and leading and teaching and staffing and all of that stuff. That he can learn all those things without having to lose everything to learn them. Uh, practice useful disagreement. Seek truth and wisdom. And remember that agreement with and living by truth is wisdom. Liking truth is lucky. Agreeing or disagreeing. Practicing useful disagreement is wisdom. If you don't like something, I don't care. I want to know if you agree with it or disagree with it. Sometimes you'll find you dislike it. In fact, you downright hate it. But you end up agreeing with it because you know it's true. You just don't like it. One of the things some people don't like is the mandate to grow. Like, I don't like that. I want to be comfortable. I want to have fun. Haven't I earned the right to just have fun? Like, maybe. <laughs> you have a right. Is that the truth you want to teach and lead? What if your eight-year-old decides, well, I finished third grade, that's enough. You know, there's some very famous people in history that only had a third grade education. And you know, uh, maybe not. Like, well, you know, Thomas Edison struck out when he was 12 and stopped going to school. Do you guys know that's true? 12 years old, living on his own, traveling the railways of the, the United States, eventually became one of the most prolific inventors in history, absolutely transformed the technology of the world, Age of 12, off on his own. Now here's an interesting thing. Age of 12 started a newspaper. Hmm, must have been pretty okay at reading and writing, huh? To start a newspaper he's selling to adults. How many 12-year-olds today could read, write, spell, logic, gather news, typeset, and print up your own newspapers at the age of 12? Yeah. Around here, we have some kids raising their hand. <laughs> Most places, you probably wouldn't have that. 
So agree, disagree, like, dislike, lemmings. Think about it. Agree with things, disagree with things. But don't make your decisions on liking and disliking things. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the power of your lessons. We thank you, Lord, and I do hope and trust that people will learn this lesson and gain the insight and the wisdom. And